Welcome ladies and gentlemen to our presentation today about leg and foot stress fractures by Corey, Brittany, Habib and Elaine. To start off, we will talk about the etiology. What exactly is a stress fracture? A stress fracture is basically a prolonged overuse injury that leads to small cracks in the bone. And here are the two types, insufficiency and fatigue. Insufficiency fractures happens when you have normal activity on abnormal bone. An abnormal bone is defined as bone that's healing, bone with a decreased density and increased elasticity. And as you can see, these are symptomatic of osteoporosis, so insufficiency fractures are common in osteoporotic adults. The next is fatigue stress fractures. This is when you have excessive force on normal bone. Going to the gym and lifting excessive weights or having traumatic strain through vigorous exercises also combined with decreased osteoblast and increased osteoclast activity rate can actually compromise the bone and give you a fatigue stress fracture. The incidence of uh, stress fractures in the leg and the feet in the general public is difficult to compare because of definitions and the diagnostic criteria. There are variations in the definitions and diagnostic criteria in the studies that we found. Also, the, most of the studies that we found were actually performed on the athletic and the military population. This is why it's not generalizable to the main public. Hence, incidence, true incidence is difficult to determine. As you can see on this pie chart here, tibia accounts for about 50% of stress fractures, and the distal tibia, occur, the distal tibia is uh, most implicated on the tibia, while the middle, tib middle third of the tibia has the longest prognosis of healing. Tarsus account for about 25% of uh, stress fractures of the lower leg. Fibula accounts for about 66 where other bones account for about 18.4%. Here are some risk factors that might predispose an individual to stress fractures, gender being the most. Lower bone density, the use of OCP, and less lower extremity limb muscle mass in females actually predisposes them to more stress fractures. Also, the military population and the athletic population who usually have a common mechanism of injury are also implicated. Prior history of stress fractures and uh, lower leg length discrepancy also are risk factors for stress fractures. 73% of tibial stress fractures occur in the longer leg, whereas 60% of fibular stress fractures occurs in the shorter leg. So the clinical presentation, uh, observation is really important. Patel et al. found that the patient might have pain granulation. It was common in about 81% of patients with stress fractures. And you also want to look for abnormal biomechanics, such as leg length discrepancies, uh, valgum or varus at the knee, pes planus or pes cavus at the foot. Uh, history, this is critical. You definitely want to listen for the key stress fracture findings that the patient will say, such as repetitive high intensity of training, beginning a new training intensity, uh, limited rest periods, previous history of stress fractures, or if they're female or have one of the female triads, such as eating disorders, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis. These are all compromised bone health, so it's really critical that we pick up on these. So some, here are a list of signs and symptoms that Patel et al. and Betcher et al. found. The main one you want to look for is pain with ambulation and uh, weight bearing, also very point tender over the site of injury. Those are pretty uh, key. Okay, so for the examination, you definitely want to palpate and make sure the patient has point tenderness over the fracture site. You may also want to measure leg length to see if there's, uh, that's causing some of the problems, and you definitely want to recreate the patient's pain. So Patel et al. and Betcher et al. used the hop test and tuning fork to do this. With the hop test, they found that um, 70 to 100 percent of people with um, stress fractures actually had a positive test, but also 50% of people with shin splints had a positive test, so you definitely want to be careful with that. And then for the tuning fork, a small study found that it had a sensitivity of 75% and a specificity of 67%, but again, it was a small study, so more research is needed on these. So if you suspect your patient has a stress fracture, you want to refer them for imaging, and you can use radiographs, bone scans, and MRIs. While conducting your initial evaluation of the lower extremity, it's very important to get a thorough history and exam to rule out red flags like cancer, infection, and compartment syndrome while these are emergent situations. You'll be looking out for these other items during your differential diagnosis as well. Some types of cancerous tumors that could present as musculoskeletal pain are osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma. If these go undetected, they can lead to overt, fraction and overt fracture and metastasis. Compartment syndrome is, also, is an emergency situation. Some of the signs and symptoms are listed below, and they include pain associated with compression of the structures of the lower limb. It's important that you check distal pulses like the dorsal pedis and posterior tibial to make sure your lower extremity is getting blood supply. Here are some other pathologies that you may run into during your exam and may mimic stress fracture-like symptoms of the foot. 
if your initial evaluation leads you to suspect a stress fracture is the cause of your patient's bone pain, you should refer for imaging. Bone scans and MRIs are the best diagnostic tools for picking up the pathology as they are both highly sensitive. You can see that bone scans are, have a high sensitivity rate of nearly 100% and MRIs are com comparable to that. The thing about MRIs is they're just higher cost and the good thing is they don't emit any radiation. This is a radiograph and if you, you can see here it's very difficult to see the stress fracture and it could easily be, be missed. Moran et al. said that 85% of stress fractures are missed the first time and 50% the second time through radiograph. This slide shows a navicular stress fracture in a side-by-side -side comparison of radiograph versus a bone scan. On the left is the radiograph, on the right is the bone scan, and you see the bone scan detected stress fractures um, as highlighted by these hot spots, while the radiograph did not. All right, so for intervention, you have conservative treatment, which includes non-weight bearing, the use of pneumatic leg braces and modalities, and for surgical treatment, you have drilling, bone grafting, intramedullary nailing, and ORIFs. So most sources suggest using non-weight bearing cast immobilization for six to eight weeks. It's the most commonly used conservative treatment and it has a high success rate. These sources also say that NSAIDs can be used initially to reduce pain and your primary treatment along with your cast immobilization is modified activity. So you want to modify the risk factors. It is important to note that metatarsal stress fractures do not require immobilization because it has an excellent blood supply. So for the use of pneumatic leg braces, the results are conflicting, however multiple sources did find that pneumatic leg braces may assist with healing and reduce time taken to return to sport. So for the use of modalities, ultrasound is not recommended for routine use, but it is an option at sites that are prone to delay or non-union or in elite athletes. Pulsed ultras ultrasound and e-stim may allow for earlier return to sports, but more clinical studies are needed. So for surgical treatment, it is indicated if fractures dislocate or do not heal with closed treatment. It's becoming increasingly more common, but it remains underreported in the literature. And last is at all advocate surgery for stress fractures of the navicular bone. A systematic review conducted by Torg et al. found no difference between non-weight bearing conservative treatment and surgical treatment regarding outcome. They did find a trend favoring non-weight bearing management. Many patients are undergoing unnecessary surgical management for these injuries, so they suggest that non-weight bearing for six to eight weeks should, should be the treatment of choice unless surgery is indicated. So for prevention, Rome et al. conducted a systematic review and there was limited evidence suggesting using shock absorbing insoles in the boots of military recruits to help reduce the incidence of stress reactions in the bone. So for um, prevention, you want to do patient education and you want to correct intrinsic risk factors and extrinsic risk factors, and those are located on the slide. You can read those at your own time. And strength training um, to include a generalized strength training program that includes resistance training of various resistance loads. So this slide just indicates a 12-week lifting program that Magnus et al. use to help reduce the incidence of reoccurrence of stress injuries in runners. So the prognosis is difficult to determine and it varies on the location and intensity of the stress fracture and we do know that stress fractures can heal spontaneously if they're alleviated from the aggravating load from a time and the patient's stress fracture should be fully united and consolidated before they return to sport. Uh, so this is just an estimation that allows it all put together for approximate healing times for the different locations of stress fracture. Again, it varies depending on patient and intensity of stress fracture. So one of the main questions that people usually ask is, when can I return to my sport activity? Basically, the bottom line is, gradual increase in loads should be started 14, week, 14 days after pain-free ambulation. And also, the rate of resumption of the activity is individual and should be modified according to the symptoms and physical findings. Clinical bottom line, return to sport or activity depends on the individual and should be modified according to patient symptoms and physical findings. Our sources indicate that after ambulation is pain-free, a gradual increase in loading is the proper progression before full return to sport or activity. However, more higher level research needs to be conducted in all aspects of leg and foot stress fractures. Thank you, here's our references and have a good day.